Good morning, everyone. I must say I'm rather surprised to see so many of you here this morning. We had a marvelous day yesterday, uh, uh, partly thanks to the excellent arrangements made by our hosts, who have been quite extraordinary in their generosity, and uh, partly because of the uh, contributions we heard yesterday, which seemed to me to almost exhaustively cover the topics which we are primarily interested in. But perhaps you'll forgive me if I just uh, say a few words about the subjects I'm meant to talk about in this keynote address, which is aimed at trying to form a pat platform for the other distinguished speakers who follow me. But would you forgive me, because, if I, because of the hospitality, uh, tell you my favorite story. There uh, was a colleague who was due to go to Manchester to uh, give uh, a talk on occasion of this sort, and he had the misfortune to choose the day when two teams you might have heard about who are in Manchester were playing against each other. And unfortunately, although the Mancurians are deeply devoted to football, as some people in Turkey are as well, they can never make up their mind as to whether they're supporting City or United. It's becoming easier at the moment. But anyway, my friend was told of the clash and that uh, perhaps it would be better if he didn't come in the circumstances because it was winter and it was cold and nasty and to make all the way up to, as an elderly former judge to Manchester might be a mistake. But he will, couldn't be put off, so he set off on his journey. He was met at the station by the uh, person who was meant to be chairing the lecture. In the car journey to the place where it's going to take place, he said, I'm awfully, awfully uh, sorry, but I've got uh, another engagement I have to go to. Uh, uh, and uh, my f former colleague said, fine. He went into the hall and only find, found one person there. So he made his uh, speech as he intended to. And when he finished, the sole member of the audience uh, said, would you mind waiting? And he uh, said, uh, uh, why? And he said, the person who was sitting there said, I'm the other speaker. <laughs> anyway, this is the fourth of a, a series of keynote addresses. And the task of making a keynote address is uh, difficult in those circumstances, but what I've got to say is very important. It's, uh, it's about the questions which really go to the heart of this subject in, in my mind. First of all, the question of the independence of the judiciary. And secondly, the, the other aspect of justice, and that is how you protect human rights uh, which go into making the rule of law. I regard the two, two issues as very closely related, but as a former judge you won't be surprised as I feel particularly strongly about the justice issue. Having devoted the whole of my professional life to the issues of justice and spent more time as a judge eventually, then as a practitioner, uh, naturally, the well-being of the judiciary is extremely important. And what came over to me yesterday, which was, I thought, very important, the point was made in relation to the independence of the judiciary about culture. And I think that because of that, I may be able uh, to say something one of two things which might be of some relevance. We are singularly fortunate in the UK that the standing of the judiciary is, on, in my experience, exceptionally high. And that is something which hasn't happened overnight. It has been hard-earned by the judges who preceded me. I like to say, and I think I'm right in saying this, that we have had a legal system 
which has been evolving probably before the 13th century. There's been two early important matters which were uh, uh, became part of our unwritten constitution, although they were in the documents. One was Magna Carta, which next year will celebrate its 800th anniversary. Now, Magna Carta was only a document which recorded an agreement between the monarch at that time and the uh, nobles. They were trying to find a way of compromising their differences. But Magna Carta became not only a foundation of the liberties of the British, but also of the Americans. And when we celebrate our 800th anniversary next year, London and other parts of the UK will be swamped by American lawyers coming to pay homage uh, to Magna Carta. And they've taken the principles enunciated in Magna Carta more seriously than we used to. And I'm glad to say we're beginning to recognize that Magna Carta is extremely important. And the other piece of uh, uh, history which is so important is habeas corpus. The idea that uh, you can have a situation where somebody's been wrongly arrested and they can come to the courts and make the person who's responsible for the arrest justify that arrest. And certainly when I was sitting, habeas corpus was still an application which was given priority by the courts. The courts who dealt with that sort of application uh, traditionally would take a case, an application of habeas corpus first thing uh, uh, on the day after the writ had been taken out and examine the circumstances and at least give interim relief if they couldn't decide it finally. The majority of contested matters would go uh, to, uh, to adjournment, but the issue would be seized on by the courts and they would not let go until they determined that. And that was a real symbol of the importance of the of the judiciary and the independence of the judiciary, but also a role uh, 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 of what we now talk about the rule of law in our societies as it is. And even with regard to the rule of law, as you heard yesterday, the rule of law is really an enactment of the values contained now in Europe in the European Convention of Human Rights. Those are the values which we reflect in the rule of law. And it, I think it's not properly recognized in my jurisdiction that the essence of, of, of the, the, the rule of law is that people should be constantly reminded of those values. And the way in the UK that we achieve that constant reminding of those values is the fact that under the Act, the Human Rights Act, the government of the day who is presenting legislation has to make a declaration by the minister who is presenting the particular piece of legislation that it doesn't conflict with the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act merely introduces into our domestic legislation the European Convention of Human Rights. And that is making a clear symbol and notice to all concerned as to the importance of those rights. And I feel that, that is something we should hold on to tight and value. 
in all jurisdictions, complying with those rights can at times be controversial. First of all, there are rights that are designed to protect the citizens, but all citizens. The citizen who at a particular time is highly unpopular in the country in question because he's been portrayed and probably was somebody who'd been guilty perhaps of a very serious crime. But at the heart of what I'm talking about is the fact that whoever you are, whatever you've done, you're entitled to the protection of the law. Now, if you're going to be protected by the law, you must be able to go to a court and get a remedy from the court if you need to. And it's no use going to go to a court where they don't look at what has happened independently. And we heard from the admirable Attorney General of Vermont yesterday about his oath that he takes when he comes into office. And judges in my country take a very similar oath. And I'm sure if we peeled the onion and looked at the history of the one in Vermont, it came originally from my country and was taken over to the States from my country. And it's the essence of that oath that you've got to treat everyone equally. But is it mere words? Does it ma matter? I can assure you, and I've taken part in many ceremonies involving the introduction of new judges into the judiciary of the UK, that judges do take it seriously. They do regard it as a mandate as to what is required of them and it influences them. It was said yesterday, and I'm repeating myself here, that it was the culture which is important. Well, I think that oath reflects the culture. But it also goes very deep into the attitude of the people who become judges in the UK. We are very fortunate indeed in the fact that people still want to be judges because there really is quite a considerable downside. You're there ready to be shot at and sometimes the shooting is very uncomfortable. And it's often crack shots who are making a target of you in the newspapers or some parts of the media. And there's other, you've got to change your lifestyle. It's not so easy to wander into a pub as if you, if you aren't a judge, if you're in visiting a town where you're trying cases and imposing punishment. And props are really singular in this area when we attach so much importance to material things. Most of the people who are becoming high court judges in the UK are people who are giving up at least 30% and probably more like 50% of their income, if not more, to become a judge. And if you, if you, as we do today, have children later, and we have the burdens of a family, that is a very huge sacrifice indeed. Yet the competitions to become the class of judge I'm primarily talking about, who is at the center of our system, the High Court judge, who can trace his history back to Magna Carta, you can see that that is quite remarkable and we get these people of high talent putting behind them a career which could have been much more comfortable and taking the one-way journey, and it is a one-way journey, to the uh, a High Court judge. And as long as that continues, we can be assured that the independence of the justices, judges is safe. The fact is, that nobody, to my knowledge, ever tries to bribe a judge in my country. And the reason is, they know it would be unthinkable for a judge to take a bribe. And that's a wonderful situation uh, to be in. I can't recall any judge being convicted of taking bribes. But I can tell you, if there is a case, which I should be aware of, but I'm, I'm not, it would be very exceptional. The culture means 
that you'd ever have temptation put your way. And so I suppose we are not tested because the public have such confidence in the integrity of our judiciary that they would not seek to try and do that. Even though sometimes they're dealing with cases involving parties of immense wealth and immense resources. And that is critical because unless you believe in the objectivity of the judge who's hearing the case, you'll never be satisfied with the quality of the judgment. And I would say, and have said to our media, that in that situation, you should be very careful when you launch an attack on the judges, and certainly politicians should be very careful if they launch an attack on the judiciary, because you're undermining the public's confidence in the judiciary. And once you've undermined that confidence, it's very, very difficult to win it back. And that's why I think I was very lucky to be in a situation where I could take for granted the independence and integrity of my, ju my judiciary as Chief Justice. It's a dual independence. It's an independence in relation to the body of the judiciary as a whole. It's also an independence in relation to each individual judge. I could not, as Chief Justice, give orders to any of my colleagues as to how they determined the case, no matter whether they were the newest judge on the block or who'd been well established. They were entitled to their individual independence. And I knew that I could try and offer guidance, but if I tried to give orders, they would immediately react, and rightly would react, and protest that this was my overstepping my responsibility. And you know, we should realize that everybody benefits from that. The government of the day benefits because they pass and cause parliament to pass laws galore. And somebody's got to enforce those laws and it's the judiciary together with the prosecutors who must have the similar independence. So the government has a very benefit. But equally at the other end of the scale, the individual has the benefit of that. And this is something which is so important. But you know, the judiciary couldn't do it themselves. I believe there's a partnership. First of all, between those who are engaged in the job of giving advice to government. They have a heavy responsibility. And the government's legal service, and I had a very close contact for part of my career with them, share the sense of integrity I talk about. Sometimes their advice was not right, uh, more often than perhaps uh, should be the case. But they, the fact that they gave honest advice and did the, performed the task we heard about yesterday, I had no doubt when I was their standing counsel. And the situation is one where they support the judges, but so does the legal profession. The legal profession's integrity is critical. They must do their professional duty in our type of uh, legal system, because if they don't, the judges would get things wrong and come to wrong decisions. They would taint the judiciary in the eyes of the public. But we have total reliance upon them, and they respond to that reliance. And they are also the people who are primarily the sources of the new judges. So that is why they must be seen in that light. And so that again is very important. So you have a, a, a tradition of integrity throughout the legal profession. I understand and have met one or two a number of the people in our, my audience today are students. What I would like to say to you is recognize the importance of what I'm saying about your professional standards. 
I think it's much more difficult for students today to maintain those standards than when I was a student, because life is so complex and the pressures which you are put under are so intense. But they are very important, those professional standards, and they also affect how the judiciary is looked upon. Now, the second half of what I've been talking about, which is going to be a very short uh, few comments, is the, uh, how do you protect uh, the rule of law? Well, in my view, what I've said about the judiciary is totally critical. <coughs> it's the other side of the same coin. Because unless you have independence of judges and a court to which you can have access, all the rights on paper are not worth the paper they're written on. But if you have got the two sides there, then these become very important. Now, of course, there can be controversy, and of course, there'll be difficulties in accepting sometimes the, the, well, the decisions of courts. Difficult for the government, and it's particularly difficult when it's a, an international court, like the Court of Human Rights, from which we are going to hear uh, later today. The Court of Human Rights is really a very impressive institution. How they cope with the 47 jurisdictions to which they are responsible for overseeing, I don't know. I tried to help them, but I don't suppose I provided a bit much help in two reports which I was involved. But uh, they come in for criticism just in the same way as uh, uh, the English judiciary, but probably more intense, because it's much easier to poke fun or criticism at a court which you are only a small part responsible for. But the same principle lies behind it. If you don't like the decisions of a court, you're entitled to use all the rights of appeal the legal system gives you. But what you shouldn't do if you're a government or if you're an individual is applaud the decisions if they're in your favor and abuse the, the person responsible if the decision is against you. Justice can never be perfect, but we can do our best and as long as we do our best, the public will accept it. But you know, can I emphasize this? These standards on the whole are improving all the time. And the justice systems in most countries are improving all the time. And I've been talking in a global way. And I want to emphasize, if I may, two or three things before I conclude my remarks. The first is that the rule of law is international. It may not be precisely the same in all jurisdictions, but it is international. And in most countries of the world, they may not do it perfectly, but in most countries, if you talk to the people in charge of those countries' legal systems, they tell you they're doing their best to uphold the rule of law. And on the international point, the matter was put extremely well by uh, 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 a former Attorney General, Soli Sarabji, recently, in, in a writing, he, 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 in a lecture that he gave. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to read very quickly what he said. What he said, it needs to be emphasized there's nothing Western or Eastern or Northern or Southern about the underlying principle of rule of law. It has a global reach and dimension. Rule of law symbolizes the quest of civilized democratic societies, be the, the Eastern or Western, to combine that degree of liberty without which law is tyranny, with that degree of law without which liberty becomes a license. In the words of the great Indian judge in the Supreme Court, the rule of law is the heritage of all mankind because it's the underlying rational, rationale which is the belief in the human rights and human dignity of all individuals everywhere in the world. 
And the other point I want to draw your attention in these concluding remarks is it's no easy business being a judge. Sometimes you have, and especially today, huge difficulties in deciding what is the right answer. And a, a, a small country like Israel can have great difficulties in rationalizing how to approach human rights. And they had a very distinguished uh, S Supreme Court called ju Chief Justice called Justice Barak. He's no longer president of the court. And he had to deal in one of the cases in which he uh, uh, was presiding on the pro absolute prohibition of torture in a situation where the security forces of the state are also concerned at the same time in protecting citizens. If a suspected terrorist is in custody, believed by the security forces to know where a ticking bomb is hidden, surely in such a situation, the security forces can use just a little bit of torture, a little bit of torture to protect their citizens. And he was able to take the firm line and say no. And he explained why in these terms. This is the fate of democracy, and not all means are acceptable to it, and not, not all methods employed by its enemies are always open before it. Sometimes democracy must fight with one hand tied behind its back. Nonetheless, it has the upper hand. Preserving the rule of law constitutes an important component of understanding of security. At the end of the day, the strength and spirit that, that allows it to overcome these difficulties it will triumph. And uh, I don't, if I may, will bring those remarks to an end with that clear warning as to how you should approach the rule of law. Thank you very much.